second man, Luke. Luke was a doctor, a physician. And he gives us a unique insight into the life of Jesus, the ministries of Peter and Paul. In fact, without Luke, there would be no gospel of Luke, and there would be no Acts of the Apostles. Now, we've been studying Paul's second men, and what you're going to find is there are all personality types surrounding Paul, all needed, all important, all necessary. You have the the kinder, gentler, encouraging type people. And today we have a man, not that he's not kind, but he's more of an intellect. He's a researcher, a historian, an educated man. All kinds of second men are needed in the Lord's kingdom. With all their talents, with all their interests, we might even say with all of their gifts. Luke's unique intellect, his education, his profession, his dedication, all plays a vital role in the ministry of Paul. He was a researcher, a scientist, and a supporter, a man who saw people as they really are, or as they really were. So today's second man we're going to look at, I almost thought I was going to have to combine Luke with someone else because there wasn't enough material Shame on me, I was wrong. When I began to really look, there's a lot about Luke we can learn. And to be thankful for his example as an intellect, as a professional second man. Here are the points we're going to use then as we talk about Luke today. He had an unwavering commitment to finding out, to researching the truth and the details of the truth. He used his profession to further the cause of Christ. He had a unique love for the lowly and downtrodden, the outsider kind of people. And he was devoted, as were the others, to the spreading of the gospel. So first, let's consider he had an unwavering commitment to the truth. You know, Luke was not one of the twelve apostles. Luke was not one who traveled with Jesus. All that Luke found out about Jesus and the ministry and the life of Jesus was done through research. It was done through interviewing. It was done through talking with witnesses. It was collecting information. And so this man who had a deep desire to know the truth and to understand exactly who Jesus was as a Gentile man, Luke a Gentile, he went out and he found out as much as he could about Jesus. Were it not for Paul's second man, Luke, we would know nothing of the Acts 2 day of Pentecost and Peter's sermon. We would know nothing about the early church. All the things we read about in the book of Acts, we would know nothing about them unless God saw fit for a different person to reveal them. We would know nothing about the journeys of Paul. All that we studied in in these lessons about the second men about Barnabas, about the first missionary journey, about Silas, the second missionary journey, about Timothy, the third missionary journey. We would know nothing about those journeys unless uh, God provided another way were it not for Luke revealing them to us. And as I stated, Luke was not an eyewitness to the life of Christ, but he set out on this meticulous investigation scouring documents, interviewing witnesses to create an accurate, academically sound accounting of the life of Jesus and the events of the early church. If this is your type personality, you along with encouragers and other gift givers in the church play an important and vital function in the body of Christ and in the ministries of Christ. The prefaces of Luke and Acts give us insight into Luke's unwavering search for the truth. So let's look at those. I have them for you. You can read along with me. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. It sounds pretty academic, doesn't it? Therefore, Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also for me to write an orderly account for you, 
most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. There is then the beginning of the, the preface, the thesis statement, if you will, of the Gospel of Luke. And then the beginning of Acts, Acts chapter 1, 1 through 3. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And then he goes into the history of the church, giving us those first days, the, the selection of a replacement person or man for Judas, and right into Acts 2, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, and then right on into the ministries of Peter and Paul. So who was this person receiving this document? Who is Theophilus? Well, there are some suggestions that have been put forward. Here are four. He might have been a high-ranking Gentile Roman official. This title of excellent, this title of being excellent, um, was very typical of high officials in the Roman government. And here's a comparison example. He could have been a wealthy benefactor in Antioch. We know Antioch of Syria was the, the jumping-off place. It was the home church for a lot of these missionary journeys. And he may have been just a wealthy man who was there, a benefactor uh, in the mission work. Or perhaps, and less likely in my opinion, one of two Jewish high priests who served in Jerusalem who were named Theophilus. <clears throat> Some have even suggested it could be Paul's Roman lawyer. Acts could have been a brief or a collection of materials, to use a modern term, a dossier, uh, of their put together for de defending um, Paul in Rome. Scholars have noted that Luke had an outstanding command of the Greek language. His vocabulary is extensive and rich. His style at times approaches classical Greek writing, as in the preface of his gospel, while at other times he queen, uh, seems quite Semitic. He is familiar with sailing, had a special love for recording geographical details, and all this would indicate that Luke was a well-educated, observant, and careful writer. Here are some other points that kind of give information about his character. Well-educated, as we, as we pointed out. He wrote to appeal to the Gentile mind. He used Roman dates. He used the names of Roman emperors and governors. He used terms like master rather than rabbi because he was a Gentile and appealing to the Gentile mind so that would be more un understandable to Greeks who might not really understand the depth of who a rabbi would be. Half of Luke's gospel consists of material not found in the other three accounts of the life and work of Christ. And Luke was thorough and comprehensive, unwavering in his commitment to the truth. One other quote. Luke was thorough and comprehensive, unwavering in his commitment to the truth. He didn't assume things. He carefully checked things out. And we too should be sure that our beliefs are firmly grounded in the scriptures. Luke had a desire to thoroughly search for the truth. And so should we. If that is your personality type, if this is you, if this is the kind of person you are, we are so thankful to have second men like this in the church. Those who search for the truth, those who have a, a great intellect to investigate and find out things. There's a place for intellectual and analytical and scientific second men. They are thinkers, maybe even the perfectionists among us. Number two, Luke used his profession to further the cause of Christ. What was this profession? It's revealed to us in Colossians 4.14. I have various translations here. They're all pretty much the same, but just a slightly different flavor to them. The NIV says, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, sends his greetings. 
The New King James says, The beloved physician greets you. The New Living Version says, The dear doctor says hello. And you have here the various ones that basically tell us the same thing. Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. He was a beloved physician. He was a good man, a good doctor. Now the book of Acts references the possible illnesses among the missionaries. Imagine what a blessing it would be not only to have this intellect among them, this researcher, this educated man, but also to have a doctor among them. Timothy's frequent illnesses, his sicknesses, Paul's thorn in the flesh, which perhaps was some kind of physical malady like his eyesight, some have suggested. In addition, the missionaries were subject to difficult living conditions. We know about their hunger, their beatings, and other bodily hardships. How wonderful to have a physician among them to help treat um, and do triage on some of their injuries. Not only to their bodily um, ills, but also their emotional ills as well as physicians, doctors who deal with people's illnesses also spend a lot of time on mental health. So he would have been an encourager in that way as well. Now let's think about our own uh, congregation here. We have a wide variety of professional skills represented. I tried to think of all of them. If I missed yours, I apologize, but I tried. Think about professional skills represented in this room. Custodians, secretaries, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, bankers, professional assistants, dentists, salespeople, factory workers, electricians, cashiers, civil servants, educators, police officers, firefighters, truck drivers, business people. And then I have, to name a few, so if I missed you, that's the rest of everyone else. But that's a, a wide range of professions. And here was a man, Luke, as a second man, who used his profession not just to make a living, but use his profession to help in the kingdom of heaven. So as you think about the profession that you have, think about how those skills that you have as a professional person might be used to further the cause of Christ. What can you do with your personality type, your training, your skill set, your profession, to use those skills and those things you're good at and you've been trained in to further the cause of Christ. And Luke found his spot as an intellectual man, as a professional doctor, physician, to use those in doctoring the missionaries and taking care of them and traveling with them. Luke used the skills of his profession to further the cause of Christ, and so should we. Number three, Luke had a unique love for the lowly, downtrodden, and the outsider. What you're going to find when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are sometimes called the synoptic gospels because they're similar. They're synonyms. They're similar to each other. But Luke stands apart in that he tends to bring out the stories of the lowly people. He tends to reach in. For instance, he's the one who tells us about the Good Samaritan, not in the others. Because the Good Samaritan lifts up this outcast Samaritan and lifts him to a prominent and good light. And that's Luke's pattern. He likes to find the downtrodden, the lowly person, the outcast, and to elevate that person. As a physician, Luke would have had more experience working with the infirmed, the diseased, the outcasts of society, many of whom were, would have blamed their illnesses on sin or others would have blamed their illnesses on sin. And because of these experiences, we find many societal outcasts appearing in the book of Luke. And Luke showed how Jesus loves all men because of the value of their souls rather than the position they hold in society. Luke, being an outsider himself, a Gentile, was naturally interested in the fate of other outsiders, downtrodden, the women, the hated tax collectors. The Gospel of Luke emphasizes women who were uh, suppressed socially during this time, Samaritans, 
tax collectors, repentant prostitutes, sick and infirmed. These are the ones that Luke tends to uphold. Now to give you an idea of this, let's turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 beginning. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water from my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now can you think of a more impactful story than that? Were it not for Luke, we wouldn't know that story. This woman, this woman with a reputation... This woman with a reputation who came to Jesus, repentant of her sins, using her tears to clean his feet and wiping his feet with her hair, and the judgmentalism of all those who were there who were scorning her in their heart. And all this story Luke puts together to show how much Jesus loves every person, no matter who they are. It's beautiful. And it's the gift that Luke gives us in his gospel. In the same light, Luke emphasizes Mary's role in the birth of Jesus. Matthew gives us Joseph's dream and his role in the birth of Jesus. But Luke is the one who tells us of Mary's story. Luke names all the women, or many of the women who participated in the ministry of Jesus, who gave of their own means. Luke gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan, as I noted earlier. Here's another quote. In Judea, as in other places throughout the known world, women in Luke's day held a low place in society. For example, some historical accounts of the time report that Jewish men prayed every morning thinking that they had not been born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Luke's perspective differs from the common portrayal of women at the time. Luke tells of the birth narrative from Christ, of Christ from Mary's point of view. Luke writes of Elizabeth, Anna, the widow of Nain, 
of the women who attended Jesus, uh, anointed Jesus' feet in the house of Simon the Pharisee, we just read. And Luke portrays Martha and Mary, which was our Bible reading for today, and Mary Magdalene. Luke is the one who elevates these outcasts and shows that God loves all people and that Jesus has come in an egalitarian, in an equal presentation of himself to all people. Luke had a love for the downtrodden, the outsider, and the marginalized. It's a great example, and so should we. Number four, Luke was devoted to the spreading of the gospel. Really, this is a characteristic that all second men share. Yes, they have different personality types, different skill sets, different personality, different gifts of the Holy Spirit, all the things that might be different. But there's one thing they all have in common, and that is that they love Christ, and they love reaching out to the world with the message of Christ and spreading of the gospel. And we are first introduced to Luke in Acts chapter 16, just after Paul received the Macedonian call. And in verse 9, it says, After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And this is the first of many we passages, we call them in the book of Acts, where, he, where um, Luke goes from saying, well, Paul went here and Paul and Barnabas did this, to saying, we did this. It's, now I've joined them and we did this. And so Luke has joined. And this is the first one showing that Luke had joined the group. This picture shows where he joined them at Troas in Asia Minor during Paul's second missionary journey. Luke was left in Philippi during the second missionary journey, picked up again to travel with Paul on the third journey. Luke accompanied Paul on his journey to Jerusalem and to Rome. So Luke is particularly present at the end of Paul's ministry when he goes to stand trial before Caesar in Rome. And he's on that journey that would have also uh, involved this, the shipwreck in Malta along the way um, and would have been with him during his imprisonment. In fact, while Paul is imprisoned in Rome... In 2 Timothy chapter 4.11, the Bible says this, Only Luke is with me. So there's Luke. With Paul in prison in Rome, and Luke is there with him, attending to him. Luke was a devoted missionary, accompanying Paul on his journey to Rome to face trial before Caesar. Perhaps Luke carried with him some of his Luke and Acts writings as evidence for a legal brief to present to Caesar. Either way, Luke was well-equipped to provide assistance both bodily and spiritually to Paul. Luke had a love for the gospel, a love for the care of the ministers of the gospel, and that's a wonderful quality too. Not only did he have a love for the lost, but he was there to love the ministers who were providing the care of the gospel. He cared for Paul as a person, tending to his physical well-being, supporting, encouraging, mending, and being faithful to him until the end. Tradition tells us that Paul was beheaded by Emperor Nero in 64 AD. This is tradition. This is not Bible stuff. At a time when many Christians were murdered after being blamed for the great fire of Rome. If you're a historical person, you might like to look this up. It appears that Luke was with Paul until the end. Luke had a love for the gospel and a love and care for the ministers of the gospel, and so should we. Historical research shows it's thought that Luke, after the death of Paul, that he went to Greece, and in Greece he finalized his writings during this four or five year period. Um, just after 64, when Paul died, from there to about 68 or so, that um, he wrote and completed the Gospel of Luke and of Acts. He was buried in Boeotia, Greece, and his remains now rest in three locations, if you can believe it, it, according historically. Padua, Italy, his rib in Thebes, Greece, and his head in Prague, Czech Republic. Um, Here's Boeotia, um, the province of Greece, where Luke died in AD 84, at the age of 84, it's thought. It's here just in the southern part of the country of Greece. 
I just thought this was interesting because I'm kind of a nerd. But uh, recent scientific analysis of all three relics, the different parts of his body, confirmed that the, the, one who's, the, the body that's there, these three parts of the body, is actually a man of Syrian descent, Syrian Antioch, Syria, which was the place where Paul began his missionary journeys, who died in the middle of the first century. So perhaps it really is his remains that are there at these places. At any rate, Luke was a professional. He was an intellectual. He was unequivocally dedicated as a second man. His unquenchable thirst for evidence, evidentiary truth, his willingness to use his profession for the cause of Christ, his love for the downtrodden, his support of the furtherance of the gospel and the gospel's messenger serves as a wonderful example to us. He spotlights what can be accomplished behind the scenes just out of view in encouraging and supporting the works of God. My goal in presenting these lessons is to show that every person in this room is important. Each person, as a front man or as a second man, whatever your gifts, great or small, encouraging, intellectual, investigating, Whatever your talent, ability is, when put together, creates a beautiful body of Christ. Each part doing its work, each part depending on the other, each part glorifying and building up and maturing each other into our head of the body, that is Jesus Christ. Let's try to be like Luke. He was a good man. He loved the lost. He loved Paul. He loved the downtrodden. Let's try to be like him. If you'd like to respond this morning to this lesson, I encourage you to come as we stand and sing.